Perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. A uh, very good evening to one and all. Uh, today, we've got a very interesting topic uh, at hand. How much do you really know about how the criminal economy works? Do you really understand uh, the criminals' motivations, their methods, and how they interact with one another? Join this session as we discuss the who, what, how, and why of the criminal attacks on the games industry. Here are the key questions that will be answered in this question. First is how criminal operations are similar to enterprise operations. Uh, second is primary motivators and how crim uh, criminals actually profit through their tactics. And the third one is a walkthrough, uh, a, a walkthrough Akamai's next-gen fish-proof MFA service at the edge. Join Akamai's Steve Reagan, a threat researcher, and Jonathan Singer, senior industry marketing manager, and Sharath Rao, senior solutions engineer at Akamai, as they delve into how criminal economics works in the gaming industry. So, uh, Jonathan, over to you. All right. Thanks so much. And Nikhil, again, uh, you know, I thank you every time, and I want to continue to, because really, you're, you're a very generous host, and we're really happy to be here on, the, on your channel. So, we have a really fun discussion today. Uh, I'm going to bring up some slides, uh, which will sort of be the background to our discussion today. Um, and uh, I'd like to again introduce Steve and Sharath. Both of you, Steve, thanks for joining me this morning. Sharath, thanks for joining me this evening. Um, we are going to talk about criminal economics, and this is a favorite topic of mine. Um, and we're going to start by talking about players. And the reason we're going to talk about players is that the games industry provides really some of the mo it provides players with you know cutting edge increasingly connected and customizable entertainment experiences and that's some of the best in the world right and these experiences obviously resonate with players who put a lot of time and a lot of money into games now the kind of complication here is that not all that attention is so good right so if you combine global attention to rising revenues, especially, you know, the booming market here in India, um, you combine that with the move from physical to digital distribution of games, subscription services, and really high customization through microtransactions. What you also get is the attention of organized crime, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, and so that means that your players are highly targeted because they've got a couple things that criminals look for. Right, so they are engaged in social communities. They're, uh, they have disposable income and they tend to spend it on gaming experiences. So that's sort of the backdrop for our talk today. Um, and Steve, let's talk about this a little bit more because you have done a lot of research here. So let's, let's talk a little bit about players before we, before we even get to my agenda slide, which is next. So the interesting thing about players is, you know, like, like everything you just said, they're, Gaming victims in the, the, the gaming economy are a unique type of victim for criminals, and it's because they're so interconnected. What I mean by that is, is think of it like this. How many gamers do you know only play one game, only play one genre of game or one type of game? You don't. And it's, it's a very common thing in a reality that gamers play games. They have their favorites. They have their their specialties that you know they like to focus on. But for the most part, gamers will play anything because they like to game. And criminals know this, so they take advantage of that. When you look at the altruistic nature of gamers in general, um, in 2020, for example, hundreds of millions of dollars were raised for charity by gamers who like to spend their money and donate it to worthy causes that disposable income makes them a big target for a lot of criminals. And then when you get to money-based games where you're actually spending real money and real currency in the game in exchange for like prize pools and things like this, that amps up the target pool another notch because now criminals are paying attention to actual currency when it comes through. And when you look at shared experiences across gaming, you have this camaraderie among gamers that victims like to target so what i mean by that is it, i should say criminals like to target when they're they're looking at it and what i mean is you'll see one type of attack targeting a particular subset of gamers and then if they're successful there they use that success to pivot to another pool of gamers and try to leverage the previous successes and target on them by playing on the conversation that's bound to happen. We saw this scam 
And then you'll start seeing attacks are like, hey, you saw this scam. So you want to avoid it. Click here. We'll tell you how. And that's how they get them there, too. Really popular in uh, MMOs and mobile games, those types of attacks. You'll see a lot of that. And so, yeah, that's that's a quick breakdown of the players. But All right, fantastic. There's there's something else that I want to call out here, and that's that we talked about value already in a couple of different ways. And this is going to be a, a key question that I want all of you who are developing games and, and building games, working on games to think about, which is what is the value that your players put into your games? Because different types of games are going to have different types of value. And those are you know, different things for criminals to extract. So value could be you know, in a real money game, money, prize pools. Um, it could be your personally identifiable information, right? So your credit card details or your banking details, however it is that you pay for things. Uh, it could be your account itself if you play a different type of account. Um, if you uh, play a game that has a lot of um, you know, customizable items that can be uh, traded, you know, are those, uh, or can they even be sold on, on kind of gray markets? Are those a target? Um, are actually just because you've put a lot of time and ground to a high level in, in say an MMO or some other type of game like that, is your account itself something that other people would want to steal and then sell so that someone else can just play at a high level and not have to go through the grind that you've done? So there are all different kinds of value and all of them can be extracted by criminals. Yeah, so. Yep. And I think just to add, I think one of the most important values also is, you know, like with the pandemic that's in, right? So there's a lot of uh, disposable income that's in, and it's important to, uh, you know, and at that point of time, there uh, was a big boom in the way how uh, the, the player increased in the gaming in the India market, right? And there we saw a lot more people wanting to stream their gameplay. And uh, the value for them is their own, you know, so to be able to have a celeb status by attaining followers and millions of people watching their game play. I think these are all some of the things that, you know, will, will definitely be of very high value for the players. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get later to some survey data uh, from a survey we did with DreamHack, uh, which is now ESL. Um, and we surveyed professional esports players and hardcore gamers and these esports players, everyone's, everyone has either been hacked or uh, defended against hacking attempts of their accounts. So that's, that's another great point. Um, so so let's, let's, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, Steve. I was going to say, you actually made a really good point with the, the social following and the streamers and how everybody has that, that dream of becoming big on like a, a Twitch platform or you know, something like that. And what's really interesting about it, when you see these discussions in criminal marketplaces and things like that, they tend to avoid those gamers, the high profile streamers, because if they get caught, that's a platform that's going to amplify the mechanics of the scam or, or whatever they're running. And that tends to ruin the whole thing. So they avoid those at scale unless they're specifically targeting streamers. And there are ways that they do that. Um, they do that with modules that you can add into like your streaming platform. So like, here's a little extra add on that you can do that does like a widget thing for your screen. Please load this up. It's a backdoor on their computer. You know, things like that, they'll target streamers directly with. But when you, you, you consider like the, the typical victim pool, they avoid the top tier streamers if they can identify those accounts because they're afraid they're going to be outed. Yeah, and that is an excellent segue into our topics today, uh, Beyond Players, which is one, we're gonna talk about how criminals operate. Uh, and specifically, you know, uh, we, we're, we're already touching on it now, but we're also gonna talk about the actual how of criminals operate, which is that they are shockingly similar to modern enterprise practices. Um, the second, also a good segue, is that a criminal's goal, right? That's almost always easy profit, right? So that's another reason why they might not go after high profile folks, um, people who have MFA enabled. It's because they really want things to be easy. They want to get the low hanging fruit and get that money and move on because uh, time is money. Um, and so to get that profit, they focus on phishing, account takeover, uh, and some other, uh, other tactics. Um, and again, the third thing we'll talk about is how to mitigate them. Um, and we're not going to say stop because you can't 
completely erase cybercrime, right? But you can make their lives really difficult and less profitable, and that should really be your goal. Um, so from there, do you guys mind if we uh, we move into the main discussion here? Go for it. Cool. All right. So this should look familiar to anyone who is, has worked in a tech company, right? And Steve, let's let's talk a little bit about this and, and how criminals operate. So when you consider how the criminal economic situation works out, it's easy if you just compare it to what you already know. And for most everybody operating in an enterprise space, you're used to a company that has structures and tiers and organizational constructs. So you have developers, you have project management, you have sales, quality assurance, you have middle tier management that, that kind of, you know, keep everybody in line and keep, you know, things focused. And you have like actual marketing and PR people that, that go through and, and promote the product or promote the, the, the particular instance. Well, on the criminal side, it's exactly that. Criminals have developers. These are the ones that write the malicious software. These are the ones that write the modules for the malware and the Trojans. These are the ones that come up with the crypt values for ransomware. You have project management. They're the ones that literally will control the developers and the, the access brokers. They're going to control the, the sales and marketing of what forums get pitched to and things like this. And they kind of act, project managers would sort of act like middle management. But middle management is where you'll see multiple project managers. So you can have, depending on how big the, the operation is, you can have a project manager that only deals with freelance coders for malware add-ons and things that have been requested by customers. And then a, a project manager that only deals with infrastructure outlay. So this is finding all the C2s you need to host the malware. This is setting up all the domains you need for a phishing attack, things like this. All of that stuff goes into play. And then you have, you know, sales and marketing, which is exactly what you think it is. And when you go to a criminal forum and you see that we're selling, you know, this, this criminal selling malware that has the following features and offers the following price tier, that's sales and marketing. That's just pure sales and marketing. And when you look at the payments and how things are, are divvied up, it's almost like a pyramid scheme. So for every tier you have below you, a percentage of the aftermarket effect of the attack, which could either be ransom, if ransomware is installed, it could be the sales of malware collected logs, it could be the sales of usernames and passwords, things like this. All of the money collected gets paid up the chain to where the main organizer, or the management overall, they get the largest percent of the profit and then it's split between everybody else. And then you have freelancers. And what's really interesting is the freelancers travel between groups. So a malware author that predominantly works with mobile malware or types of attacks, they'll go between other groups developing for that and they'll work on their own. And so they get paid a commission up front and then they get a kickback off of installs and things like that. It's really interesting to see it operate because it does mirror what you would consider the legitimate economy almost completely. So you know, we talk about different criminal groups here. I, I think one of my questions is, how much is this centralized versus decentralized? And where does reputation play into the whole thing? So it's 50-50. Some of it is centralized. You have groups that are dedicated to only one type of attack or one type of market. And then you have decentralization to where you have groups that will target whatever's going to make them the most right now, whatever the hot topic is. So mobile gaming, for example, is a big deal because there are a lot of mobile gamers and as the industry grows uh we we did a report a couple of years ago where we actually had data that showed that you know it's expected mobile gaming is going to eclipse console-based gaming like within the next year or two you're going to see more mobile gamers out there and the criminals are going to follow that pattern they're going to see that so in a way that's still decentralization, but at the same time within those groups, you're going to see people focus on certain types of mobile gaming or certain types of platforms or gaming types. And that's gonna be a real thing. When it comes to the reputation, that's still key. And in this type of environment, the reputation is how good is the malware? How good are the attacks? How clean are the phishing kits? Are they easily spotted? Can they be avoided? Are they found and detected before they can even be used? All of that pays into a, a, a type of profile for reputation. 
And the better the reputation, the more sales you get. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. There is one more. Oh, sure, please. Yeah, yeah, so I was just telling that, you know, I mean, uh, absolutely. I think uh, this also in the India region, right? What we observe is there are a lot of these developer experts who have been trained on penetration testing, who have been doing a lot of these uh, malwares and building Trojans themselves. Uh, they know the what, they know the how, but I think it's more important to educate why, because then that is where the ethical hacking comes into the picture. Uh, and most often the enterprises, you know, and the structure we see here, they all are in their twenties, right? So it's important to sort of, uh, you know, provide the right sense of education, the right sense of attitude before they even start hacking, because that is where it gets really tricky and they cross the line. So I have one more example that I want. Steve, did you did you have something to say there? Well, I was I was thinking of a uh, we did an interview uh, a couple one of the security groups I'm a part of. We did an interview with a ransomware author who was in his 20s, and he was an ethical hacker. You know, he he took all the the same stuff, and we asked him, "Why did you go to crime? Why are you doing this?" Money. The money was there. It was really hard for him to find a job legitimately, like a legit pen testing job or a security job, but the money was there. The criminal market was there and it was instantaneous reward. You know, he would get the same, he, he it required the same skills and the same knowledge set that a legitimate legal security job would require, but no barriers to entry. All he had to do was prove his worth and suddenly he's making $30,000 a month American. Now, he, he is from uh, a, a Southern Asian country. I don't want to out the guy. But this is life-changing sums of money for him. You know, he does two or three gigs a year, and he's basically set for, like, the entire year. He does not have to work if he chooses not to. And it was that simple for him. That was the choice. And I think you see a lot of that in the, the criminal world. And it's not, we're, I know we're, we're supposed to be talking about gaming today, but it's bigger than gaming. It's, it's a, an entire ecosystem that's filled by kids who are bored, highly educated, highly motivated, but they're bored. And there's too many barriers of entry to get them into legitimate jobs. And so they turn to whatever is going to keep them entertained at the moment. And sadly, that's crime. Sorry, I got off on a tangent, but it was, your comment made me think about that. <laughs> That's that's important context. Uh, and it's it's funny because like at least in the US, all I see are articles on my LinkedIn feed about how um, there are so many cybersecurity jobs and that there aren't enough people to fill them. And so it, it sort of it sort of makes you wonder where the disconnect is. And and that's not something we're gonna solve today, but no, but it's just really interesting. You know, you see this stuff for like pen testers and things like this, and they're entry-level jobs requiring 10 years experience. And it's like, eh, no, you're not gonna get it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's an HR problem. So that's for someone else's panel. Um, so let's let's move on with our discussion. Um and you know. Uh, I wanted to bring up a really specific example of, of, of a criminal operation here, and, and this is sort of a botnet, right? And so these are all the different pieces, and I know that, uh, Steve, you can talk a little bit about this, and then, and then Sharath, I know you have some, some things to add here, so. Uh, really, I've already covered most of this stuff, you know, like the, the operational side of thing, this is where you see the project managers get the, the, the most involved. And that's because infrastructure for a lot of these attacks, particularly bots, is critical to their operation. If they lose their infrastructure, they lose the bots. So they maintain strict regimented controls when it comes to how to obtain infrastructure, where to obtain infrastructure, and how to keep it online and keep it balanced. It's amazing how in the enterprise world, we're always thinking about, you know, load balancing and backups and redundancy and you know things like this and criminals absolutely keep that model in mind because if one section of a bot or one c2 goes down they need to make sure another one takes its place immediately that failover has to happen and that's what you see you know in operations that's what project managers are in charge of all right yeah yeah and i think uh, botnets are a very crucial part about uh, how the reconnaissance phase happens 
uh, before they launch an attack, right? Uh, so before they get the initial access, this uh, so these botnets keep running an audit on the gamer apps, the domains, what ports are open, what are they running on, where are they running, are they on cloud, are they on uh, running on on-prem? Uh, and this information is a constantly running script that these nets are running on, right? Uh, and such kind of an audit, I'm not sure if the company or, or say the organization do it themselves, but at least the botnets keep a close uh, eye on it. Uh, and the moment there's a new domain open and they know that that domain might or may, you know, like it may not be behind a WAV, then then they know the weak door, right? So I, so I think it's very important to sort of, you know, like it doesn't matter if you have 100 domains or, or doors open, uh, and out of them, 99 might be behind a WAF, or you know, it might might be protected. But the attacker, the botnet, all that they need is that one weak door, um, and that's it, right? So it's very important to sort of keep a close audit, uh, and that is where I think bot botnets uh, are really tracking very close. So to kind of expand on that. Um... <clears throat> one thing you hit on is the botnets doing the recon aspect of, of the attack chain. What's really interesting is the bots are the ones doing the recon and the, the basic probing, but that information is sent back to an access broker who then takes the compiled information and starts to verify the, the bots details. And then they augment that. And then the access brokers then turn around and they take that completed work product and they sell it to other criminals who are then going to leverage it in the attack itself. And what's what's particularly interesting in this, and you see this a lot with ransomware groups, is once the recon aspect is done and the access brokers are, are, are working, they then look at existing vulnerabilities and other things, what could be leveraged, and that's how they get further into it. So to your point, you can have 100 domains and 99 of them are behind the WAF. That one domain that was left exposed, maybe on its own, it didn't need a WAF to protect it. However, because it wasn't up to date with like, say the latest patch for Apache or Outlook or Exchange, rather not Outlook, but you, because it was behind, that's what they used to get you. That's how they're coming in. And what's really interesting is there are a couple of groups now that they go in after they've they've compromised your system and they patch it for you so that if you run vulnerability scans on your infrastructure, you see that you were up to date. You are. They patched you. That's nice. But now they're selling that access on the open market and everybody else will be coming in behind them. It's just a scary thought with a little more color. <laughs> All right. So that's, yeah, th thanks for, we'll, we'll leave it on that particularly scary thought. <laughs> and let's, let's start talking about criminal goals, right? And we talked about this earlier that a criminal's goal was always easy profit. And that is going to be a theme that we're going to talk about throughout all of this. Um, and, you know, when we get to the last subject, I'll reiterate it. Your job uh, as someone building a game is to make their life as difficult as possible so that they go bug someone else. Um, so, Criminals tend to target players with phishing and credential stuffing attacks. Um, and, you know, their goal here is account takeover, right? They want that value that we started off by talking about. So again, what is the value that you provide, that your player accounts provide? Why would they attack you? How would they attack you? What's the easiest way in? So, you know, Steve, you've done, again, a lot of research here. Let's talk a little bit about each of these attacks. <clears throat> So phishing is uh, self-explanatory. I am going to take the assumption that pretty much everybody watching and listening later, you're familiar with phishing. You know, the, the goal with phishing is to make the victim do something. Is that open an email? Is that click a link? Is that opening an attachment, sharing information, whatever. It's to make them do something. And that translates down to, you know, just ask. If you want to take over an account or you want to, you know, to, to target a particular gamer, just ask for their credentials and maybe you'll get lucky and they'll give them to you. Phishing attacks are everywhere from extremely basic and easily spotted to very sophisticated. What you see on screen is a phishing attack that targeted um, Steam players. A message was sent to a user or a trade request was sent to a user. And then when you go to the profile of the the account making the, the, the request, you would see a legitimate looking profile that, oh, well, yeah, if you want to accept it, just go ahead and log in. And when you click the login button, that's when you get 
fished. That's the phishing attack. And it happens so seamlessly in the window that for mobile users, it would be very hard to detect because the URL itself is truncated. That way your entire uh, URL bar isn't seen. So if you looked at the URL bar on your phone, you would see the Steam links exactly as you were, you were expecting them because the URL is super long. Attacks like that are effective. That's why they work. And because you see, because the effective rate is still so high, you know, anywhere, depending on the, the nature of the attack, it could be 40% or better. And I know 40% does not seem like a lot, but when you're targeting 100 people a day and you get 40 of them to give you credentials and you can get 40 brand new credentials, there are criminals that have made empires off of that. And so when you see high success rates, you see this type of attack just keep going and going and going. And then outside of phishing, you have things like credential stuffing and you have things like uh, password spraying and things like this. And that plays off the phishing. So they get the credentials from the phishing and then they try them on every account on the internet, not just gaming, but every account. If it's a major type of social network, they're going to try those credentials there. If it's an email account, they're going to try them there, business accounts, financial accounts, things like this. And then once they take these accounts over, particularly in gaming, this is what you see on your screen here, this is where they try to resell them. Now, there are a lot of open markets, meaning it's, it's straight public. We're not talking about criminal forums or anything. These are just open player markets where you can sell accounts. A lot of times the accounts being sold are being sold by the player that maintains and owns the account. A lot of times it's just being sold by randoms who have compromised a bunch of accounts and they're dropping them off for 10 to 15 bucks a at a time and just trying to, you know, eke by a living just by selling off games that they don't want to play or they've done played and everything like this. You'll see a lot of that. But when you consider what's in the account, and that's your, your value, Jonathan, look at the information that's being collected. Are you collecting personal information that could be used against that player later? If a criminal got a hold of it, that's valuable to a criminal. They're going to collect that. They're going to use it. Is their financial information exposed once you log into the account? Is that trust immediately there? They're going to take that information. They're going to use it. I've seen lots of accounts in the mobile space to where you could top off the account with, you know, fresh coins or whatever to play the game. In that mobile device, your credit card information is stored and it's being stored poorly. So if a criminal was to ever get into that account, they get your card data. These are things you have to look out for and watch for. And this is why when you develop, it's not just the external security controls that are so important, but all the internal ones as well. You have to take care of the value prop for the, the player. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think just to add, uh, you know, uh, just, just similar to the example of Steam, where we saw that, you know, phishing happened, uh, there can also be potential uh, skimming attacks, right? So especially with uh, card games, board games, poker, and all of that sites, wherever we don't have a mobile app, right? So on the website, the JavaScript, the third-party JavaScript can be compromised. They can have CVEs, which are uh, not fixed or patched. And um, the exact username and the pass, pass, password and the credentials that, that are being fed in can be skimmed and they can be sent to the attacker destination, right? Uh, and that, again, comes back to the point where the accounts are being sold. Uh, and also from the application attack standpoint, from an API attack standpoint, with fantasy sports and RMGs, uh, scoreboards and leaderboards are something that's uh, being hacked a lot. And with a lot of these game publishers and uh, fan fantasy sports and RNG players out there, their priority is to, is to get the product out there first and think about security later, uh, which most often is the main problem because you know, when they don't look at security uh, and they get the score scoreboard attacks or leaderboards attacks just for the cash price, you know, they they all they always want to be on the top of the leaderboard. Uh, the brand value is at stake. Uh, the player trust is at stake, right? So it's important to uh, yes, it's important to go to, go to market soon, uh, but we definitely suggest you to look at security right from the beginning, uh, so that you know the brand. And the entire, uh, you know, uh, the trust of the player stays back. And I think this is where, you know, it's, it's important from an API uh, protection stand, standpoint, from a bot detection and mitigation standpoint, it, it becomes extremely important.
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this more in sort of the last section of this. But if you're building a game and your players give you anything to play that game, they're trusting not only that they're going to have a fun time, but they're trusting you with their information. And I think that it is really incumbent upon anyone who is building any sort of online application that collects information from people that security is, is really a paramount concern because as like the entire internet is based on the value of people's personal information. All of the major companies who, who have really um, made the you know web 2.0 what it is and this and these are this gets into like the concerns around web 2.0 to 3.0 which we're not going to get into right now um but but it's all built around information and personal information and what you give away for free to get products for free right and uh, and so it's just you you have to be thinking about security um so i'll, I'll leave it there I, I won't i won't bang the drum too much more uh because that's really what this entire talk is about um, and so let's let's talk about how to mitigate attacks. I think that should be our that should be our last section before we start opening it up to Q and A. And again, we've got kind of three pieces here, and it's all about value and protecting your value. So why is a criminal attacking you? What is their goal? What do they want out of your your IP, right? Your intellectual property. What do they want out of your player accounts? what are the ways in which what you have is valuable to them and they would want to strip it. Um, next, we're going to focus a little bit on visibility on multi-layered security, which we'll dive into, and also partnering with your players, uh, which again is, is really key because the you know security is only as strong as the weakest link. And as we saw with phishing, often that is your players. So how can you strengthen them in addition to your own systems? So Steve, let's, let's start talking a little bit about this. Oh, <laughs> there are Big so fly. many ways. Good way there, to start. There's, there's so many ways to to talk about like <clears throat> how to defend your game and how to 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 build security. And this kind of goes back to to what we were just talking about. the The fact of the matter is, 20 years ago, bolting security on after you've gone to market was actually pretty commonplace. It's not a it's not a new concept. It's not novel. We've done it before. The problem is criminals have adapted to that model and they have grown leaps and bounds over the last few years to the point to where they're attacking things willy nilly almost. And what I mean by that is like, if they see a, an app, they're going, to, they're going to attack it. If they see an API connection, they're going to attack it. If they see a new game, they're going to attack it. It's just, it's there. They want it. So they're going to look at it. And so when you don't build security in, you've exposed yourself. And the thing is, these attacks don't always have to be instantaneous. That's the key. Just because a criminal sees that you're vulnerable does not mean they're going to hit you right away. They're going to pay attention to you. And then they'll go in and hit you later when it's convenient for them. They don't have to hit you right now. So the longer you let these problems exist, the more exposure you're going to have to criminals. And keep in mind, it isn't one criminal scanning and looking for you. We're talking dozens of bots are hitting you every hour on the hour looking for these vulnerabilities, and all of them are reporting back to different people. That's a reality. There was a, an old thing years ago, <clears throat> years and years and years ago. You'd take an unpatched Windows XP Service Pack 3, put it on the internet, just leave it sit there. How long until it's compromised? Literally minutes. And that thing is owned by any number of bots. Well, that was years ago. If you think that it's not faster and more efficient now, you haven't been paying attention. And so it's, it's one of those things to where we stress this for a reason. It's because we've seen apps and APIs and, th and the infrastructure completely fall to criminals who are just doing base automated scans. We're not talking sophisticated nation state actors. We're talking about people sitting at their desk, clicking a mouse and running the attack. That's what they're doing. And so when we, we look at, you know, what can you do to protect yourself, build security in. And when we talk about build security in, we're talking about rate limit your APIs. Do you know a bot right now can guess a thousand passwords a second against an unprotected API? Do you know they do that? 
it blows people away when we show them API attacks or bot, bot attacks on their infrastructure. They didn't even know they were there. They didn't have that visibility. But if you rate limit your APIs, that stuff will never come against you. Um, earlier, you were talking about <clears throat> the websites that have you know, injected Java and things like this. That's a risk. Well, if you have change monitoring on and you're, you're watching for you know, patterns in your apps and things like this, you could spot those changes when the injection happens. See, the visibility leads to quicker detection and response, which eliminates the threat because you're able to stop the attacks. That's the ultimate goal. You need that visibility. You need to be able to respond and detect things. And that's where a lot of companies, particularly in the gaming space, are falling short. You know, as mobile gaming takes off, mobile gaming is a different, different hybrid environment. It's not the same as straight up websites. And it's not the same as console development. It's a mix of a little bit of both, but you can't take a one size fits all approach to security. You have to tailor it to whatever you're developing on. Yeah. I'm going to stop I'll blabbing. I'll let you guys talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Sherith go. And then I've, I've got some, some color to add as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, uh, Steve. You know, so you, you know, uh, I think visibility is the first step, right? So before we fix a problem, we have to be aware of the problem. Uh, and most often when I speak to my customers, I get to hear that, you know, hey, we have our uh, Mod64 running at our origin. So we block 100 uh, attacks and uh, we are safe, right? So what's, what they don't have is uh, what they can't see. Right, so you don't know what you don't know, and you can't fix what you don't know. So there might be a lot of these attacks which are just going under the radar and uh, going through mod mod sixty four, say for example, uh, and they wouldn't even know that, right? So so just because a bunch of attacks are being blocked doesn't mean all are being blocked, and uh, having that visibility is the first step, right? Uh, and uh, with without uh, have having the visibility, there is nothing. Uh, much to prove even from a data standpoint. So I, so I think that's, that's a very important point. Yeah, and so here's where I hope that I built up, we built up enough credibility to give this example um, because this example is, is a little crazy. So I'm gonna give two different examples of this. Uh, and that is um, we work, you know, we work with a, with a lot of kind of smaller companies, but we work with some of the biggest, most of the biggest AAA uh, publishers and, and platforms in the world. And um, we were, we got a call last summer uh, from one of these publishers, uh, you, you know them. And they said, hey, uh, our community managers are suddenly getting a lot of reports of hacked accounts. Like we're getting a lot all at once. It's very strange. Can you come take a look at this? Um, and we said, hey, okay, um, can we turn on bot manager for you and, and see what we see? And, and we, we got them to turn it on. And, so 99.5% of their login traffic were bots. That was over 3.5 billion hits. And that's when, so when I went internally to talk about this, cause this is right, this is like, I'm in marketing. That's a marketer's dream is to be like, say a big number like this. And you talk to other folks across the company and they're like, yeah, that's, that's kind of low. Sometimes it's higher than 99.5%. Like what? Uh, so that that was eye opening for me when I when I came across that. Um, but yeah, we we see we see this all the time, right? That you know people can use these massive bot networks and they're just they're on you all the time, um, you know. And and this this is not just your really obvious like your login point for um, for credential stuffing attacks. You know these sorts of attacks have been replicated against your APIs, as we said. So we had a uh, a mobile games customer um, out in the uh, in Eastern Asia. And we turned on Botman for them, and it was uh, over fifty percent of their API traffic was not legitimate traffic. So people had found their APIs, reverse engineered them, and were using it to farm resources in their game. Um, and, and so again, it was like, oh, uh, that's not that's not a great position to be in. And, and that's also, you know, in addition to ruining your game economy and ruining your player experience, it's also really expensive just from a network perspective. That like they're paying for all of that, right? So you know. These examples of the need for visibility and the need to bake security in are not uncommon. Um, Steve, I, you look like you might have something to say on this. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you completely. But the, the thing is, you know, like particularly with the, the mobile gaming company, like 50% of their, their stuff was bots. 
the thing that that stood out when that that particular incident came up was the fact that when you track down the accounts you could actually see where they were going after the bots were done so they were farming resources in the game with the bots and then they would turn around and sell those resource rich accounts for a profit on the open net but because the API had been reverse engineered and because the API had no static protections, they were able to generate new accounts automatically. So the bots were farming and making new accounts at the same time. So once one account was up to a X level, whatever the predetermined set was and had X resources, that account would then be sold and a new account created for the bot and the bot would go on about its day. And the bot was doing both sides of it there was a, an AIO script that was being used. And what was interesting was this script would farm the game and then sell itself later as the account. And it would create a new account and keep farming. And you would see this stuff. And it reminded me of the time when, you know, like I said, the incident where we, we determined that like 50% of the, the gaming traffic was all bots. It's just a visibility issue. It's a resource issue. Can you imagine how, how deep the infrastructure has to go when like 50% of your traffic's all bots and you're paying per game, per, per, you know, game hour to the host? Like that's going to be insanely expensive. And yet that's doubling your cost all because you didn't protect an API. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, recently, I mean, like one of my other customers, uh, they had a really good visibility, right? So with bot manager and, you know, they had their own client set stuff also, but I think they had real good visibility. And uh, once they sort of got the visibility, they removed the false positives and they moved, you know, the, you know, uh, the mitigation to deny. The moment they did that, they automatically saw that their, uh, uh, their scale at their origin at their server side cloud, it, it just came down. Like they had to remove certain clusters off because the scale just came down, right? So they saved a lot on their infra. They were able to save a lot on their clusters. So they didn't need so many clusters. Uh, and that is where they could see direct savings. And I think that's that's one of the biggest uh, learnings that I had. So I think that's, that, that was great about that customer, yeah. Yeah, and I think this is uh, an, an, a really important point because um, you know, a lot of people see security as a, as a cost center, right? It's like that, that just costs me money to do. Um, but actually it, it saves you money on your infrastructure costs. It saves you money on your brand marketing and PR costs when you have to cover up for not cover up, but, you know, apologize for a breach or for player accounts being hacked. There, there are all of these ways in which security is actually a savings measure, not a cost. Uh, so worth looking at it that way. Steve, do you have any any last points on this before we talk about partnering with your players? Because uh, I don't want to. I want to make sure that we have time for Q and A, uh, and I think we've uh, frightened people enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I was going to say I think we covered it all. <laughs> We're good. All right. Cool. So let, let's talk about this study, um, which hopefully I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, so again, we worked with uh, with DreamHack a while back uh, before it was ESL. And um, we did uh, some some pretty interesting survey work with them, and found that you know a basically everyone had either been hacked or uh, you know people had a, attempted to hack them. Um, you know, really high percentages of folks who um, have seen accounts for sale. All of these, but really, um, when it came down to the end of it, we had in the in the seventy percent range, players said that they themselves were responsible for security. But also, because it was multiple answer, they also said, and you know, an even higher percentage around 70, 75% said that it is the game company's responsibility for security. So players know that they have a part to play and they also know that you have a part to play. And so this is a really an opportunity to partner together. And I can't stress this enough, right? And this is where we'll, we'll talk about MFA and we'll talk a little bit about um, making helping your players to engage with MFA and also helping them to, uh, to be harder to hack. It's, I think it's a really important part of your security strategy. Steve, what do, you, what do you have to say on this one? So I want to call your attention to the lower right of the screen, the professional streamer. <clears throat> this particular streamer had their business email targeted, 
which for a lot of streamers, that's public information. They have to put their, their business email out there. Otherwise, they're not going to get business opportunities. So the criminals latched onto that and they targeted. And through that one email, the successful phishing attack led to a compromise and attempts against Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and Steam, right? But 2FA, because they had that enabled, saved most of their accounts. The key word in that, that little quote there, the story from the streamer is most. There were two accounts that MFA was not an option. Therefore, those accounts were compromised. Now, this streamer did in the survey, when you read the, the longer response, the streamer did tell a story like, look, I know I should not have recycled my passwords, meaning that it was the same password across multiple accounts. And they realized partnering with your game and with your gamers, what happens is, is they take advantage of what you offer them. So if you give them security options, like the support for MFA, the support for long and complex passwords, they're going to use them and they're happy to. When we did the survey, one of the standout responses that was common across either frequent players or infrequent players was the fact that they're happy to work with the company when it comes to security and, and protecting their accounts, especially for accounts that require large amounts of personal or sensitive information, including financial details. And when you're doing, you know, real money gaming, that is a thing that you want to make sure you're partnering with your players on protecting their assets. Yeah. And I, and I want to, I want to say something on this and that is you can be angry at people all you want for them reusing passwords and that's not going to stop it from happening. So you can sit there and feel great when there's a public data breach about how it's their fault for using passwords, or you can tr try to prevent it in the first place. Victim, right? blaming, victim blaming never gets you anywhere. It does nothing yeah. for you. Yep, does nothing for you. Instead, you know, do everything you can to make sure that your players aren't the victims, right? So, Sheriff? Yeah, yeah. so I think this is where, you know, it's very important to understand the pattern or the login timeframes and patterns with which what devices they log in from where. And I think this is where Akamai has been uh, working on this uh, cool stuff wherein, you know, we get to track the pat pattern of logins and, you know, uh, we uh, flag it when a particular login comes from a, a different time zone, a different place, a different browser, a different agent. And uh, based on that, the organizations can take action whether they want to allow the login or not. Uh, because most often or not, the ga gamers and the hackers are uh, way, way apart geographically and even time zone wise, right? So I think this is where Akamai can really, really help uh, with our account protector solution. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to add one more thing. Um, <clears throat> and that is because, and we're going to get into the QA in a minute, but in my first time here on, on Nikhil's channel, um, I was asked about how MFA gets hacked. And we could talk about that, right, Steve? Um, oh, we could boy, certainly could talk we? about that. <laughs> uh, we're getting a visit from my son, everyone. Benjamin, Hi, Zeta. buddy. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, so we could talk about that all we want. But in the end, it, it doesn't actually matter. Oh, thank you. Oh, my goodness. It's a Hanukkah present. I got a Hanukkah present Aww. live on stream. That's really nice. Yeah, That's fantastic. Of, there are two of them. One, four. Wow. Yeah, it's a little golden snitch fidget spinner. So, oh, um, that's I cool. I picked out a fun gift. Cool. So I'll be using this. I got to go back and talk about why uh, why hacking MFA doesn't actually matter. Okay. You can listen if you want. All right. So <laughs> it, so it doesn't matter. Um, because what you're really trying to do here is like, yes, MFA can be hacked, um, but it's about low hanging fruit. Um, and it's about not having your players be the low hanging fruit, right? Because criminals want this to all be as easy as possible. So if they run into MFA, they could say, yeah, I could hack that. Or they could take that account and put it into a different file and sell that later and move on to the next easy account, right? Because it's all easy profit. Um, it will I will say this though, just to, to add into it, because yeah. you're right, it doesn't matter if 2FA gets hacked, but there is something you can do with it to partner with your gamers and to avoid 
the common elements of 2FA hacking. One is the social aspect to it. Nine times out of 10, when 2FA gets hacked, it's because the criminal has prompted the victim to share the code with them. So enforcing to your players and your, your, your members that you would never ask for such a code ever. You don't need it. You know, stress this type of educational thing to them. You could stop that element of 2FA hacking. The other is when you do 2FA, but you use SMS as a delivery mechanism, that's weak. It used to work great, you know, years and years ago, but that's no longer the case now. What's easier to do is actually, you know, get them to use a token on the phone or an actual physical piece of hardware. And that's going to be your better bet. Or, or in my, my case, uh, my favorite thing to get people to use for 2FA is a YubiKey. YubiKeys are wonderful little things, and I highly recommend you implement this stuff into your games. U2FA, it's the future, I promise. There you go. <laughs> All right, you, heard, you heard it here first, or maybe you heard it somewhere else. But um, All right, so obviously I missed half of that answer <clears throat> while, uh, while my son uh, joined us for a few minutes. So what I'm actually going to do is uh, let's turn this over to the Q&A because I want to make sure we have time for that. we got about 10 minutes left. And, and Nikhil, I want to start with you um, because you've been listening in and you yep. make games. What yep. do you think of all this? And, and, and what are the questions you have for us? Because, and again, I'm not going to ask you any questions yeah. because I don't want you talking about your security posture. No need <laughs> for that. So yeah. let's have you ask us. Cool, cool. Uh, so yeah, certainly a very interesting uh, session, you know, getting to know the other side, how people operate. And it was quite surprising how criminals actually operate as a standard organization. Uh, so uh, have you guys come across any outfits that we could also we could just name that, hey, be aware of these, uh, these type of emails or be aware of uh, these specific type of templates uh, or anything like that? Any kind of uh, educational point on those aspects? Be aware of any template or any email that is specifically asking for contextual elements of a game or a profile related to your game. So what I mean is if you get a random email, that says, hi, this is Steve from support, and we're about to suspend your account unless you log in and give us your details to confirm and verify all this, that's an attack. What they're trying to do is get you to confirm this information. They're using fear to do it. Hey, this is Steve. Listen, uh, there's a problem with your account. We don't think it's anything serious, but we kind of want you to log in and, and just go ahead and confirm that it is you that logged in yesterday to play the game. That's all we need you to do. Just log in and answer yes or no, and then we'll be on our way. Thanks. Again, they're using curiosity, a little bit of fear to get you to log in, but here's the cool part. They're not actually doing anything except confirming that you're an actual player. And now that they've got you on the hook, they're going to send you another email going, hey, we saw that you logged in. Thanks for that. Listen, turns out there was a problem. We need you to verify this information. Go ahead and log in. And uh, if, if you get a code delivered to your phone, go ahead and, and, and send that code over to this and we'll, we'll take care of that. Yeah, you'll see attacks like this. These multi-stage attacks is where they go, especially when they know they're security operational. So I see something here. Uh, well, actually, first of all, did that answer your question? Example? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay, it does. Cool. I see a question here uh, that popped up on the Q&A thing on Zoom, which is really cool. So far, we've talked about securing servers. Any suggestions to secure the client from tampering and memory hacking? <laughs> memory hacking is huge in the modding uh, criminal side of things. And one of the ways you can get around doing that is doing tampering harding. Uh, tampering, hardening, and, and things like that with your code base. There are a lot of third-party vendors that you could work with to secure your code base and prevent it from being reversed, which is where a lot of memory hacking comes from. But keep in mind, if the attacker takes over the device itself, you're at the mercy of the device. There's nothing your code can do. Uh, got it. Uh, and uh, there's, there's an interesting question on YouTube that has been asked is, uh, what is the most uh, interesting case study that you might have come across with regards to a criminal attack on a game? Oh, um, so this happened in 2020. <clears throat> it was a, uh, let's just say it's a really popular sports game that lots of people like to play online and we'll leave it at that. And you can trade virtual currency within this game. There's no real money element to it. <clears throat> they were uh, taking over accounts and flipping the accounts, but only the accounts that had high dollar value to them or the ones that had a lot of real in-game currency. 
And so they were selling those accounts. And it was like a feeding frenzy on a few of the criminal forums to where these accounts were just being bought and sold left and right. And it turns out it was just people who wanted to play the game during the pandemic. They were bored. That's what they wanted. But they didn't want to work to build up the capital in the game and to build the game out. They wanted to start off ahead of the pack and in first place. So they were buying those top tier accounts. Literally, it was just they were bored and wanted to play a game. That was it. Damn. People can go to such extents to just uh, for this, just for just the sake of uh, entertainment, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, another question here says, "Is OAuth uh, OAuth two safe?" Yes, it is. It absolutely is safe. You should use it. OAuth two is pretty awesome. If the account is hacked, is there any chance to get that back that account again? Yes. There are a lot of uh, security things you can implement for your customers, and a lot of times uh, gaming companies have recovery processes. If you think your account's been hacked, the first thing to do is to uh, reach out to the company support system and see if they have any processes that you need to follow for recovery. But a lot of times they do, and they can help you get that back. So it is possible in some cases to recover, but you can't, you can't really guarantee that. Like It's going to be up to the company, and it's going to depend on the game. No two are alike. So Sudhakar uh, Dhundi asks, what to or SAML, which one would you prefer? It's, it's a personal preference. Jonathan, which one do you like better? <laughs> I think if I had to pick, I'd probably stick with OAuth too. But... Yeah, and I think uh, just to add with the OAuth too, right? So uh, I think one one of the things that we keep, uh, you know, like seeing more often is that uh, with the access token and refresh token, especially when you use OAuth, right? And with the OIDC. So typically what happens is uh, at times that we have seen that the access token in itself is valid for a year or two. Yes, it's a good user experience. They don't have to log in again and again, uh, but one year is way too long time frame. Right, so it's easy yeah. for them to re uh, replay some of those access tokens and get through. So you know, so so there needs to be a balance between uh, the validity of access token to refresh token when they do that. And I I think we need to stick to best practices there. Yeah. For me, the the reason I I stick with OAuth is because it's it's you can go from service to service with it, and you can do a wider a wider control. Usually, when people are using SAML, it's it's pretty much from a single location is where you're doing the authentication bit. And so that doesn't help if you've got gamers or players who like to do remote. So to answer your question, OAuth 2 is my favorite. They both certainly have their uses though. It's just, it's going to be a personal preference, but if I had to pick, I'm always going to go with OAuth because it's more open and you can travel with it. And that's always going to be a good thing. We do have one question here in, in uh, uh, yeah. Zoom that's kind of long. I'm not, yeah, so I'll, I'll sum it for you. Uh, so okay, you the, rock. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so, so Tushar is asking, when you operate a game in a live environment, it's super difficult to deal with complex systems. It tends to go mm -hmm. wrong, especially with mobile games when the network is fluctuating. So his question is, how to secure calls with simplicity when there are tools like Wireshark and many more, which can easily give all the information to hackers and uh, tools which gives uh, memory information as well? <sighs> How can I answer this question without live on YouTube explaining how to hack a game? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. I'm, I'm like, I, the, the answer immediately popped into my head. And the first thing I heard was a little voice going, do not give how to's on live <laughs> television. That would not be wise. Yeah, I think um, maybe what, we might refer this question to your account representative if you work yeah. with Akamai. Um, if you don't work with Akamai, now's a good time to give us a phone call because we're going to not dive into that uh, live for, for various reasons. I think we've, we've given people enough fodder today. I, I will say this, though, without, without giving any how-tos, I will say this. There are ways to do that but it does require that you have visibility on your infrastructure and it does require that you you take care to secure the endpoint from from point a to point b when you're communicating with the client when you're communicating with the game and you're communicating with your back end all of that has to be encrypted otherwise stuff like wireshark yeah you can again reach out to your rep and uh, we're happy to answer those questions if you call in because that's not something i can get into on live television <laughs> Awesome. So basically, to, basically to answer your question, Tushar, you can get in touch with 
uh, the guys at Akamai. Uh, you can contact Steve. Uh, all of their questions, all of their social medias, you can find online. So just get in touch with them, and they can most definitely help you out. So, Jonathan, any closing thoughts? I think we have almost run out of time. So, any closing thoughts, Jonathan? Uh, well, I think we've covered a lot today. And again, you know, I think the the key things that we want to hammer home are security is important. You should do it. And uh, if you have problems, talk to us. Um, but you know, before I before I wrap up, Nikhil, like again, you know, we have fun having these conversations, and thank you again for hosting us on this channel. Uh, I hope that you had fun listening. I hope that everyone in the audience, thank you for for joining and sticking with us uh, and asking really fantastic questions. Um, I wish that we had more time for questions. Uh, maybe next time uh, we do something like this, we'll have to. Um, We'll have to shorten our talk time and, and leave more time. But thank you so much again. And Steve, thanks for being up early in the morning. For those of you who can see the sun rising behind you. Yeah. Uh, you. And, and Shara, thank you again for your help today. Nikhil, thanks so much. Um, and we're back. We're back soon, right? We're back uh, with another uh, other upcoming session, right? Yeah, yeah. That is scheduled for next week, Wednesday, same time. Guys, stay tuned with my channel. And uh, we'll see you again with yet another interesting topic at Akamai's Gaming Masterclass. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks, cool. everyone. Thanks, okay, everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks, Sharad. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, see you guys and uh, stay tuned for the next session. Thank All you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Steve.